Here today is Andrew Lawrence Ingersoll. He has a mass, he received his Master's of Arts in American History from Rutgers University Camden with a focus in colonial American history. He currently teaches at Camden County College and Cumberland County College. He is also the curator of the Gibbon House Museum, which is part of the Cumberland County Historical Society. Thank you and let's welcome Andrew Ingersoll. <laughs> This is um, kind of a collection, it's a, an assemblage of lectures that I normally would give, um, but pertaining to a particular topic, uh, something called Anglicization. Uh, Anglicization is the process by which colonists came to see themselves as British, and that process plays a very big role in what leads up to the revolution. Um, so hopefully by the end of this, within an hour or so, um, reasons for the revolution will be a little more easy to piece together within the context of the time. So it's all, it's about building the world, the context. Right. So, uh, this particular story begins in the 1660s. Uh, with the what's called the Restoration. For about a ten year period, there were no or there was no King of England. He had been uh, beheaded. And England was ruled by a Commonwealth. But after ten years of the Commonwealth, the monarchy was restored. And the Restoration saw the rise of um, new ideas, many different new ideas, which will directly influence what we're talking about. One idea in particular was something called mercantilism. Uh, mercantilism is an economic theory. And it states that economies should be regulated in a way that directly uh, promotes uh, national power. And one form of mercantilism had already been used. Um, uh, the, the chartered company. Uh, Virginia was settled by the Virginia Company. This was a private company. Uh, with sh uh, shareholders uh, who were, uh, the company was given permission by the Crown to settle in Virginia. So the Crown gets people to settle there, but doesn't actually have to uh, risk anything of its own. It's the company doing the risking, and hopefully the benefit will, the profit will benefit everyone. But during the Restoration, mercantilism took on a new character. Because if England was truly, truly to become great, it had to build itself up. And mercantilism was a relatively easy way to do that. So the English government would have to um, develop things and encourage manufacturing and commerce to get trade, because trade would be the source of England's greatness. Because with trade comes taxes, and taxes end up in the treasury. So the basic principle of this new mercantilist system uh, was relative, it was very simple. Uh, England needed to make sure that it was exporting more than it was importing in terms of value. Uh, basically, if, if England was importing, say, $20 million worth of goods, it had to export $30 million worth of goods. Uh, so it would profit to some extent. But this system only works if it had a place to export goods to, particularly English people. And where were there a lot of English people not in England at this time? The colonies. So after the 1660s, the American colonies begin to take on a very specific function. Uh, they were expected to export raw materials, things like lumber, um, pelts, uh, sugar, which comes from the Caribbean, but the colonies of the Caribbean were no different than the colonies on you know, what is America today. Um, 
And in return, they would import things like um, cloth, glass, paint, uh, metal, uh, manufactured items. And those manufactured items would be worth more than the parts that they were made of, those raw materials. And that was what would make the whole system work. And with that, England would see an increase in revenue and eventually greatness. Now this new system was implemented by something called the Navigation Acts. And this was how England regulated trade. And it basically required that certain goods, which were called enumerated goods, things like, um, things that were especially valuable, sugar, tobacco, uh, these goods had to first be shipped through English ports. So if a shipment of tobacco was headed for Boston, it would first have to go to England, where it would, an import tax would be paid, then it would be exported, where there was an export tax paid, and then arrive in Boston, where there was an import tax paid. Uh, so multiple layers of taxation all added up, again, all about making money for England. So the importer in Boston was paying the export tax in England and then the import tax into Massachusetts, which is far more expensive than if he was just exporting uh, tobacco from Virginia. Um, but that really demonstrates how the colonies related to England. We look at the colonies, you look at a map, and it's a you know, nice straight line of all the colonies. Um, but the colonies actually fit in the British world. Each one was linked only to England. There was no intercolonial linkage. Each colony was basically its own thing directly linked to England. So it's not a mass of colonies, it's a bunch of individual colonies, which is how this system works. And this system was aimed at stimulating a lot, not of, a lot of income, firstly through that trade, but also if you're trading more, you need more ships. Those ships have to be built. Uh, shipbuilding would have to, would require more lumber, which would be imported, adding more wealth. There were a lot of secondary and tertiary uh, benefits of increasing trade through this mercantilist system with the colonies. So according to English economic thinking after the Restoration, the colonies were the key to English prosperity. And following that theory, if the existing American colonies were already pretty good, New additional colonies would be all much, all the much better. All the much better. Uh, so England wanted more colonies, but North America, at least the useful part along the ocean, uh, was mostly already occupied by someone or another. Now this is the primary focus of the then restored monarch. Why did it go? Uh, I hit the wrong button. Charles the Second. Charles II's father had been beheaded. Charles II is restored, and he has a particular goal for England, to make it great, which he's approaching through this mercantilist system, primarily through new colonies. Now, at this time, there were a handful of English colonies. Virginia, which was pretty much modern Virginia, stretching up, uh, well, where modern Virginia goes, but then down towards South Carolina, and all the way until... Basically, the English colonies went until the Pacific Ocean on paper, though no one ever went there. It's, they were very um, both uh, Maryland, Massachusetts, uh, Connecticut, Rhode Island. That was it. Those were the British colonies in America. Then there were the Caribbean colonies, etc. But America wanted more colonies. But again, there wasn't much. Uh, there wasn't really any available colonies, uh, primarily thanks to the, the Dutch. Uh, the colony of New Netherland uh, took up most of the northeastern seaboard, <coughs> extending all the way up into what we know as Canada. So this was preventing England from getting new more colonies. But in 1664, England solved this problem. They went to war with the Dutch. Now the Dutch possessed the most powerful trading company in the world at this time, the Dutch East India Company. And the East India Company was very much involved in New World trade through this colony. 
but primarily the Dutch East India was interested in Asia, China, and India. So when the English come and start a war, no one really cares. This isn't a valuable part of the Dutch Empire. So the Dutch basically, they, they fight, but they don't really fight. And the English attack and capture the Dutch colony of New Netherlands, which contains all of modern day uh, New Jersey and much of New York, as well as Pennsylvania. And with that, they took control of new ports and a lot more coastland and a lot more territory. Now, King Charles, again, the spearhead of all this, wanted to immediately organize this into the empire, along this chartered uh, or um, mercantile system. We didn't want to repeat the mistakes previously. The Virginia Company that founds Jamestown failed. And it wasn't until the Crown stepped in that Jamestown started to turn a profit. Massachusetts, it's kind of separate, though Massachusetts Bay Company was more for profit than, say, the pilgrims on Plymouth Colony were. Charter companies, though, were not the way to generate quick wealth. So the English turned to a new system, something called a proprietary colony. A single person or a handful of persons would be given in, uh, control over a large territory. So. With New Netherland now in English control, King Charles made his brother, the Duke of York, the proprietor of this new territory. Who immediately named it after himself. New York, being the Duke of York. So, these proprietary colonies were to serve a single purpose. Provide raw goods and import finished goods. That's the only reason they existed. And as proprietor, James, the uh, Duke of York, could essentially do whatever he wanted in that colony. He could establish where towns would be. He could create the laws. It was his to do whatever. And this gave him the power to, for example, slice off a piece to do with whatever he wanted. And he did just that. He sliced off a chunk of this new colony in order to repay a debt of sorts. Uh, uh, two men had performed very um, admirable service for James Duke of York during the time when the monarchy was not the group to be hanging out with. During the English Civil War, uh, George Berkeley and... Um, um, or rather, George Cataract and John Berkeley served the Duke of York, uh, one, as his private um, financial manager while he was um, in hiding, the other uh, as the governor of the Isle of Jersey, which became a royal holdout. <coughs> and once the monarchy was restored, James the Duke of York wanted to repay them. And he wanted to do so by giving them a piece of his new column. So the two accepted the gifts. and founded a colony of their own, which they called Nova Caesarea, or New Jersey. But this colony, the founding of this colony, however, was not without controversy. Uh, Sirs Carteret and Berkeley, uh, they believed that they'd been given proprietorship of New Jersey, the right, both the title of land, as well as the right of governance. But James Duke of York had done no such thing. Why would he give away control, that much control. He'd given them the land, but he retained the right of government. So he was technically still in control. And while Cateret and, and Berkeley tried to assert their own form of government, the Duke of York decided to cancel their claim. It just took, this, uh, took New Jersey back. Eventually, though, the problem was sorted out, and the Duke of York returned to the colony. And there's Carteret and Berkeley decided to divide the colony up into two other colonies. Uh, Carteret takes control of the eastern part here, uh, shortly thereafter called the province of East Jersey. And Berkeley took control of the western part, called the province of West Jersey, East and West Jersey. Where the dividing line of this actually was, no one really knew yet. It was kind of 
Yes, and it would actually be a few different persons would determine where that line actually was. So there's several different divisions depending on when you're looking at the map. So East and West Jersey. But not long after this, Berkeley ran into some trouble himself. He was a bit strapped for cash. So he decided to sell his half of New Jersey to a Quaker named Edward Billage. Billage was uh, very much interested in the New World, especially as a place where Quakers could go to get away from persecution in England. So Billage had an idea to found a kind of Quaker colony. Berkeley had lands, so it seemed as if the deal was ready to go, except Billinge could not get the money. Uh, he was too much in debt to get more. Uh, he could not get a loan. So it looked as if the Quaker colony wouldn't happen. But Billinge's friend and fellow Quaker, John Fenwick, stepped in to handle the transaction and provided the funds. Basically, gave him a loan for the, uh, for the uh, colony. And with that, in 1674, West Jersey becomes the first Quaker colony in America. Now, Billinge and Fenwick had very similar histories, and they were friends. They had both served um, in the parliamentary army during the English Civil War, so they were anti-monarch, which is the side that won. Um, during the time when the um, monarchy had been dissolved, they be both become Quakers, and as Quakers, they begin to switch their support to the crown and against Parliament, which was run by Puritans. There's a whole long story with that. We don't have time. Um, and later, uh, once now they, they support the crown, when the monarchy was restored, both men were rewarded for serving the crown. Basically, uh, their, well, their sentences as traitors were taken away, and they were allowed to continue to live. That's basically how they were repaid. But the two were friends for the moment, though that would not last for long, because Fenwick intended to settle this land himself with his own colony. He took Billinge's idea, and because he paid for the land, he said, I own it. Billinge, though, claimed that Fenwick had nothing to do with New Jersey. He only provided the money. It was a private loan, uh, so that Billinge could clean up his own provinces and then, or his own finances, and then settle the province. The disagreement between Fenwick and Billinge was eventually turned over to a young Quaker who was chosen to decide the quarrel. Uh, this man's name was William Penn, and he settled the agreement as follows. Billinge, uh, because he'd arranged the deal, he would own the majority of the colony. However, since Fenwick had used his own money, uh, he would be repaid with one-tenth of that colony. Now, Fenwick was not too happy with this, but he accepted the deal anyway, and in March 1675, he set out with a group of adventurers aboard a ship called the Griffin for what came to be known as Fenwick's Colony. He advertised uh, amongst the Quaker community for adventurers interested in going to the New World. Now, in the summer of 1675, Griff the Griffin, Fenwick's ship, sailed up the Delaware River and made anchor uh, on a small inland river that Fenwick had named the Salem River, after the uh, Hebrew word for peace. And on the banks of this river, Fenwick founded a town called Salem, which he intended as the capital of his colony. Now, his whole goal was to found a colony for Quakers. This would be the Quaker colony. But Fenwick's colony proved to be relatively small and never really panned out. And in fact, Fenwick had originally planned for two separate cities, uh, one on each end of the colony. Only one was ever established in his lifetime, and it was barely established at that. Salem was not, you could barely call it a city in the time of Fenwick's life. It was a settlement. The other city was even less. Uh, but the other city, on the banks of the Caesarea River, was to be called the Manor of Caesarea, which later is Greenwich. But none of this happens within Fenwick's lifetime. So, Fenwick's colony never really gets off the ground. And most of this had to do with, let's go back to it, the Duke of York, who was not in New York. He was in England, um, but he had a lot of influence. 
Now, James, the Duke of York, refused to recognize Fenwick and Billinge's purchase of West Jersey. Uh, he said, I gave it to Berkeley and Carteret to possess, not to sell. So he didn't actually acknowledge or accept that uh, either Fenwick or Billinge could even possibly purchase the colony. So when Fenwick shows up and claims to found his own colony with his own government, the royal governor of New York, appointed by James, the Duke of York, had him arrested. <coughs> and in fact, Fenwick was arrested several times for the same thing, basically falsely claiming to have founded and be running a colony. And each time he was dragged up to New York City to stand trial. And each time the judge basically said, well, the paperwork looks good, you're free to go. But the constant travel between Salem and New York, as well as the imprisonment and the stress, etc., all took a toll on Fenwick's health, and he died in 1683. Now, Edward Billinge, meanwhile, with the rest of West Jersey, he was never able to get his finances in order and was forced to sell his share. And luckily, there was a waiting customer. Uh, William Penn, who'd first grown familiar with the Delaware River Valley uh, as a result of his arbitration of the Fenwick Billinge. Um, Fair or account, whatever, uh, he immediately stepped in and offered to buy the land from Billinge, uh, intending it as a Quaker settlement in West Jersey. And then when John Fenwick died, his estate, desperate to pay off his own debts, sold a good chunk of Fenwick's colony to Penn and friends of Penn. In fact, the same year Fenwick died, uh, a new colony was founded just up the Delaware River, but on the other side, Pennsylvania. Uh, William Penn was very much interested in the Delaware Valley. And in fact, Penn's colony would become the model restoration colony, uh, which, remember, the whole point was to import goods, or, yeah, import goods and export raw materials. So by the 1680s, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, colonies are just starting to get going. And the whole point was, again, importing finished goods, exporting raw materials. That would make England great. But soon things would change in England, which would later have tremendous influence on the colonies, and not just these restoration colonies, all of them. Now, again, going back to uh, the wrong line. That's the wrong line. Oh. Back to Charles II. Right. Now, he'd become king when he was restored, the restoration of the entirety covered. And he was seen as a relatively good king. He was relatively popular, despite the fact that he was Catholic. Now, to be Catholic in England was a, it was a very... It was not particularly seen as a good thing. Uh, Catholicism uh, was kind of seen as the enemy of England. But Charles II was good enough that people didn't mind. And given the fact that he was behind this, these restoration colonies and the economy was starting to take off, they liked him. They thought, all right, even though he's Catholic, he's okay. But by the 1680s, the English population began to grow concerned. Charles II, uh, though Catholic, had been relatively tolerant of the Church of England. But Charles II started to look as if he wouldn't be around as much. And lacking a child of his own, his brother would inherit uh, the throne. His brother, James the Duke of York, who was a dedicated Catholic and was far less tolerant of the church in England. And he had a particular grudge against Protestantism. And again, that's a complicated story there. It's, we won't get too into that. <laughs> so England was afraid that if James Duke of York became king, he would persecute religion in England uh, try and make England Catholic, or worse of all, give England to France, the then dominant Catholic um, nation in the world. And then in 1685, all those fears seemingly came true. Charles II died, and James, Duke of York, becomes James II, King of England, and Scotland. It's James VIII, I think, of Scotland. That's, again, also complicated. So, a lot of people in England are very much concerned with this. There was a fear that he would not be tolerant against the Church of England. Uh, and those fears looked as if they were well-founded. 
because A, he was a longtime outspoken critic of the Anglican Church. And then one of his first actions as king was to increase the size of the military. Now his opponents feared that this was done to help him defeat and oppress the Protestants in England. Then James II passed a law which allowed Catholics to hold high office in both the military and the government, which again seemed to uh, indicate that a Catholic takeover was in the works. And all of this is based in a fear of Catholicism. Uh, now, to understand that, you have to kind of know the role of religion within England. It was kind of a sense of national pride. Uh, England's identity was founded in the Anglican Church. And if James II was to bring Catholicism back to England, um, it would basically undermine their Englishness. Basically, England would become France. That's what they're concerned with. And that's the worst thing that could possibly happen if you're English. Now, this fear was based in some truth. Um, during the time when there was no monarch, James, Duke of York, sought refuge in France, and the King of France pretty much gave him free run of the country. Uh, additionally, uh, with James now as king, there was a fear that he would start to turn England into a mirror of Catholic France, which again was horrible. Worst case, he might just give England to France. That's even worse than that. So, this is how this reign starts. It automatically starts on a kind of rough footing. And then things got a lot worse. Because at first, James II only had two daughters. Daughters cannot inherit the crown directly. So, at least James would be the only Catholic monarch. But then James had a son, which meant there would be at least one more Catholic king of England, maybe the one that would actually see the Catholic Revolution happen. But, According to the story that emerged, this son was never actually born. Opponents of uh, James II uh, started to spread a story that James II's son had actually died in childhood. But knowing that a male son was the key to ensuring the Catholic takeover of England, the baby was placed in a wash basin covered with rags and snuck out of the palace. Then a replacement was found and paraded around as the crown prince, ensuring that the House of Stuart, the Catholic monarchy, would ma maintain control over England. Now, whether this is whether or not this actually happened, I mean, there's no record proving that happened at all. But that was a story that the anti-royalist Whig party, or Whigs, the opposition to the king, was spreading around. But the, and that tale, the wash basin baby, was enough to convince many in England that James II was basically hell-bent on returning England to the Catholic Church, which was the worst thing that could possibly happen. So, in 1688, and in English history, all the big things always happen in double years. Uh, Norman invasion, 1066. The fire of London, uh, 1666. The um, Armada, 1588. The Glorious Revolution, 1688. It's all double years. In 1688, a group of wealthy English nobles who were opposed to the crown, Whigs, uh, with the support of the Church of England, traveled to the Netherlands, which at the time was a collection of small kingdoms. Um, and they approached the uh, kings of the Kingdom of Orange. And they, invited, they asked him, invited him, to invade England and take over. Now, this wasn't kind of based in anything. Uh, the King of Orange's wife, Mary, was actually related to James, Duke of York. So they could at least justify this takeover by saying, well, it's still family, royal lineage carries on, etc. Now, this was not, like I said, all that strange. The good part was that Mary was the Protestant. A Protestant... Um, uh, daughter of James II, the, the sitting king, which again was much more preferable than a Catholic uh, son. William and Mary of Orange agreed, and they invaded England, though no one attempted to stop them. There were no battles of this revolution. In fact, what was so glorious about it 
was that it was relatively peaceful. <laughs> James II fleed, there was no death, there was no, it wasn't anything, it just kind of happened. Not a drop of blood was spilled as a result, which is why it was so glorious. But after the actual revolution, with now the dual monarchs um, on the throne, <coughs> Parliament, the legislative body of England, they stepped in and decided that they wanted to ensure that this controversy with the Catholic king could never happen again. So now, finally, the economy could get back on track and England become great. So in, 18, 18, in 1689, Parliament passed a Bill of Rights. And this Bill of Rights established several rights. Uh, firstly, it granted Parliament the sole power of taxation. The king could not tax, only Parliament. And I'll talk more about that in a couple minutes. Um, secondly, it established individual rights that all Englishmen possessed that could not be infringed upon by anyone in the government. Now, both of these two points had a common source. The philosophy... Uh, look, I have a picture of William Mary. I'm all over the place. William Mary, all right. Uh, both of these ideas, the idea of individual rights and the seat of taxation, came from John Locke, who was more or less the architect of the Glorious Revolution. And he had theorized on the ideal form of government for England. And that government was one that guaranteed the rights of all of its citizens. And these rights were seen as natural rights, rights that no one could infringe on because they were natural. And, they, and he emphasized three particular rights. The right to life, meaning you cannot be killed without a proper reason. The king, the government cannot just kill you because you have to stand trial, etc. Uh, the right to liberty, basically you have a right to be involved in the government. Uh, the government can't do anything without your without your uh, approval, again, we'll deal with that. And the right to property, which primarily means money, uh, and that ties to taxation. Now these natural rights were the foundation of the Glorious Revolution and became the foundation of what becomes Great Britain. Because not long after the Glorious Revolution, in fact, within 20 years, uh, the successor to William and Mary, uh, Queen Anne, Herself, also the Queen of Scotland and England and Wales, decided to make it a lot easier, combine all three kingdoms together under one monarch, since they already were, and just called it a united kingdom. Basically, this is the birth of Great Britain. So, for example, the British did not settle New Jersey, the English did. Uh, the British did not exist until 1708, when Queen Anne signed the Act of Union. So now we're talking about the British. And it's important to remember that the British are different than the English uh, that we've been discussing so far. Uh, primarily uh, because England was home to the English, but Great Britain was home to the Britons. And being British was an entirely new thing. And it was far more than simply being from Great Britain. Firstly, at the very core of Britishness was its definition. To be British was to be anything France was not. Uh, they're still picking on France at this time. British was the antithesis of France. And in fact, Britishness was defined by its lack of Frenchiness. It was the opposite of everything France stood for. France had an absolute monarch, Catholic monarch. England, no absolute monarch. They were a constitutional monarch. They have this Bill of Rights, they have Parliament, they have the Church of England, they don't have the Catholic Church. In fact, one of the reasons Parliament was so supportive of joining all of these kingdoms together as Great Britain was the fear that upon the death of Queen Anne, um, who had no children, uh, the Scottish, they would be the Scottish, the sitting Scottish king, would actually end up as King of England because of how all the families worked out. So the fear of a potential Catholic monarch was enough to convince Parliament that they had to join up these kingdoms now, or else risk a uh, Catholic king. So by linking England and Wales and Scotland under one monarch, who would be Protestant, and one Parliament, the English one, uh, never again would the possibility of a Catholic monarch threaten the British Isles. 
And Isles, as they were, was actually the next element in what is a British identity. Because unlike France and the rest of Europe, uh, once unified, Great Britain's borders would never change. Why? Because it's an island. So where European countries could gain or lose terrain, or territory, at random, seemingly, Britain would always be an island, protected by the water that surrounded it. And in fact, many Britons saw the English Channel as the core force that protected them from the rest of the world. And the British Isles were often referred to as Insula Fortunata, or Fortunate Islands, in Latin. That was the strength. That's what made Britain different than anyone else. It truly was separate, because it was literally separate. And Britain was especially fortunate for the English Channel, uh, because in the years between 1689 and 1815, England would fight a near constant series of war against France. And if not for that channel, there might have been a series of invasions. So it was fortunate to be surrounded by water uh, because that was essentially the key to its security. And all this ties together to form the British identity, what it means to be British. And the creation of a British national identity did not only occur in the British Islands. <laughs> Uh, it occurred anywhere there were Britons. And where were there a lot of Britons in addition to the British Isles? America. So the process by which the American colonists became British was called Anglicization. And it spread throughout the Ameri American colonies between the years 1710 and 1764. So we've seen how the British became British. Let's look at how the Americans kind of become British. Now, anglicized Americans saw themselves as full-fledged Britons. Uh, they had all the rights and privileges of any other Briton in Britain. Uh, additionally, anglicized Americans recognized that their role within this system, this imperial system, uh, was one was solely to benefit the empire. The colonists were in the colonies to make the empire great to make Britain great. That's the only reason they were here. But sometimes these Anglicized Americans, or what I call empire men, uh, they had to balance their place within the British Empire with their place within a kind of separate American world. So they had to kind of keep one foot in each of these worlds and make sure the two worlds were still on the same level. And it was a bit of a balancing act. And this is actually how the Americans become British, through this balancing act. So let's look at an example of this and kind of see the, re uh, the, the, the results and how it kind of reflects around the colonies. Now, in the 1740s and 50s, oh, there's a picture of Great Britain. The 1740s and 50s, a man named Benning Wentworth, Benning, not Benny, it sounds like Benny, but it's Benning. Uh, he was the royal governor of the colony of New Hampshire. As such, he was a full-on Brit. He was an empire man. But being the governor of New Hampshire meant not only overseeing the colony's place within the empire, but ensuring the success and prosperity of the people of New Hampshire. So he had a duty both to the people that lived there and to the empire. And sometimes those duties uh, conflicted. Now, New Hampshire's economy, in fact, most of the economy of northern states, was based around lumber. And in New Hampshire, it was the white pine. Uh, New Jersey, especially this area, um, how many people passed a field on the way here? It's because all that lumber was shipped out as part of New Jersey's role within this imperial economy. That's about all New Jersey had to provide, lumber. Uh, same thing with New Hampshire. But New Hampshire's trees, the white pines, actually served a very specific purpose. Um, being very tall and straight, they made ideal masts for ships. You didn't want a mast that was pieced together. It would be weak. You wanted a solid piece. And these white pines in, in New Hampshire were ideal for that. So the role New Hampshire played within this was to provide these masts for ships. 
In the 1720s, the New Hampshire legislature, the, the county legislature, at the request of Parliament, so Parliament asked them to do something, and the legislature did. They passed something called the White Pines Act. And the details of this act are relatively simple. Uh, all white pines in the colony of a certain height and diameter were reserved for use by the Royal Navy. So if they fit those parameters, they belong to the Navy. Now in terms of the empire, this was great because it ensured that the Navy had the necessary lumber it needed to defend the empire. So that's, that's a good role. But from the point of view of the Americans, this was actually a bad idea. The White Pines Act was bad uh, because the trees were the source of their wealth. That's all they had that was valuable. Um, selling or trading those trees is how they got everything else they needed. People weren't making what they needed. That they imported. That was remember, that's the whole point of this restoration economy. You import finished goods. You don't make them. You export raw materials. So these trees were the key. This was the wealth of these Americans in New Hampshire. So this was a problem. The White Pines Act is problematic. And Benning Wentworth, as governor, he had to both keep the colonists happy, but also ensure that New Hampshire played its proper role within the British Empire. So he had to balance these two worlds. Uh, and knowing that the White Pines Act benefited the empire, but also kind of um, damaged the colonists, Wentworth was kind of at a crossroads or a fork, something, two things coming together. He had to make the two systems work. And he did just that. Now, using his office as governor, uh, he uh, went to the legislature and he said, as governor, I demand X amount of funds. And then he went and purchased all of the trees from the loggers that were reserved for the Royal Navy. So they got the money they needed to participate in the economy and buy the things that they needed. Then he stored the trees. And when the Navy showed up, ready to cut down trees, Wentworth said, here they are, and here's the price. So the Navy paid the price, which meant the legislature ended up making money off of its initial investment. The people of New Hampshire were happy. They were paid for their trees, because otherwise these trees would just be sitting until the Navy wanted them. Wentworth said, I'll buy them now, and then he'd sell them to the Navy later. The Navy got their trees, so the Empire was happy. The people of New Hampshire got their money, they were happy. He made the system work. And in fact, this becomes a trend in the American colonies as British colonists. How do you make the needs and desires of the colonists um, uh, uh, kind of melt together with the needs of the empire? And this whole situation is actually a great example of the key to being British in America in this period. And something that was unique to British North America, a concept called voluntary cooperation. If the empire was going to work, the Americans had to play their part. But Americans were not always willing to play along. That was the whole point of Wentworth's problem. So he had to come up with a way to get the Americans to voluntarily cooperate with what Parliament required. So without voluntary cooperation, the British Empire could not work. So keep that in mind. Now, by the 1750s, the American colonies were focused primarily on fulfilling their role within the empire, exporting raw materials, importing finished goods. But soon, that very empire would be challenged and changed forever. Now, in 1754, a young lieutenant in the Virginia militia was out on the Virginia frontier, uh, modern-day Ohio. Like I said, the colonies went quite a ways. And, uh, he was leading a patrol. And while on patrol, he and his men in, um, encountered some French soldiers. And the officer ordered his men to fire. Now, the result of this conflict ignited something called the Seven Years' War, the first truly global war. And the young Virginian in question was George Washington. Uh, so George Washington accidentally 
starts the first truly world war of the modern age, um, purely by accident. And again, this is the first truly world war. It was fought across the globe. North America, it was fought in the Pacific, it was fought in Asia, it was fought in mainland Europe, it was fought off the coast of Africa, in the Caribbean. Uh, the war was truly a world war. And it was fought between Great Britain and France. Now this is the state of North America at the time the war began. The green uh, area, those are the British colonies. And the bluish purple is France. Now, France kind of has the most territory. But as the English colonies are growing more and more successful, and again, keep logging in mind, uh, once you use up a tree, it's not growing back the next year. So you have to go get more trees, which means the British are continually pushing west in search of, among other things, trees. And they can only go so far before they run into the French. This is why Washington was in Ohio to see how far Virginia settlers could go before they ran into the French in order to get the things they needed to participate in the economy. So these two ex empires were expanding towards each other. And by the 1750s it had become obvious, especially to French colonial officials, as well as their Native American allies, uh, that the British were on a path to complete control of North America. And that could only come at the, extent, or at the expense of French North America. So the French and the Native American allies reached the conclusion that in order to save what they had, they had to stop British expansion. And this is why Washington was out on the frontier, to make sure that the settlers would be safe as they moved westward. He was supposed to locate the French soldiers and then make note of where they were and say, don't go there. Instead, they opened fire, starting the war. The French saw this as an act of war, and then it just happened. Now, globally, this is the Seven Years' War. Within North America, it's known as the French and Indian War. And while the global Seven Years' War was going well for Britain, they were winning on that um, part, uh, the campaign in North America was not going so well for the British. And most of this was due to a man named Lord Ludon. He had been in charge of organizing the war in North America. Uh, and British at this time, the British at this time possessed the largest empire in the world. But Britain was a small place with a relatively small empire. So in order to fight the war, the British um, needed to... Uh, they needed the Americans to play a larger role than normally they would have. Uh, basically, it was asking Americans to step in and protect the empire, a role not usually offered to the Americans. But the Americans did not want to fight. Um, plus, the British didn't want to fight with the Americans. The British Army looked down on American soldiers, uh, and they were treated as, almost, as if they were <coughs> subhuman. So when the army shows up starting to train colonial militias, they're not really taking it seriously. And the militias, granted, you know, they're annoyed by that, so they start treating the British, you know, roughly the same way. So the whole situation really wasn't working. Uh, plus, the war was expensive. And Parliament expected the Americans to foot part of the bill. But Parliament was in for a surprise, because at the height of this war, Almost collectively, the American colonists decided that they were not willing to raise money to fund their own armies, nor were they going to send the British any money for this war. And Lord Loudon, who was charged with running the war, uh, he was basically in charge of forcing the Americans to comply. And that didn't go well, because the Americans refused to comply. And that's why the war was going bad in North America. There weren't enough soldiers. There wasn't enough money. In fact, the war was going so bad in North America that Parliament decided to uh, intervene, uh, especially after an election voted the sitting Prime Minister out of office. But his replacement actually provided the solution to this problem. And his replacement was a man named William Pitt. 
Now, William Pitt was well aware of this situation, funding the North American campaign and trying to deal with the Americans. Um, he recognized that Britain needed very specific things from the American colonies, but the Americans didn't want to quite play along. And like Benning, Wentworth, and the other Empire men, Pitt decided to try and make it work to please both sides. So instead of having Parliament bark orders at the colonies, he suggested to colonial legislatures what Parliament would like them to do. You know, wouldn't it be, it would be awful kind of you if you voted a couple hundred pounds to the war effort, if you mind. If not, don't worry about it. Again, voluntary cooperation. He's making the Americans seem like they're actually a player. It's letting them decide. And at the same time, he put in place um, measures which would incentivize cooperation. So for example, it passed through Parliament an act which stated that the Americans would be able to run their own armies. They wouldn't have to listen to British officers. This meant that colonial soldiers would not be treated as animals and would serve under their <coughs> militia leaders. Now, Pitt also passed another bill through Parliament that promised to compensate in gold all funds raised by the colonies. Now, the funds raised by the colonies was in colonial currency, which the value was very, it was very rarely all that um, standard. Colonial currency could be worth, you know, a dollar one year and 20 cents the next, depending on other issues. Gold, though, was always worth, you know, it was gold. This meant that the, the colonies themselves, the more money they raised, the more they would, uh, money they would make in gold. And this was great, especially for colonies that wanted to try and import more things. And this reimbursement scheme meant that the colonies would receive gold, which was far more valuable than their own paper currency. And as a result of all these in, um, incentives, the colonies began to comply. And they began to voluntarily cooperate with Parliament's requests. And you had persons, at some cases, even local persons, going outside of the legislatures, volunteering to use their own money to raise up companies of militia. For example, Richard Wood of Greenwich was given permission to form a company of militia. Why did he want to do that? Because after the war, he would be compensated for all the money he spent in gold which was going to, be worth, going to be worth far more than the, the currency he was actually using. So this was a great way to incentivize cooperation. And within two years of this, France is defeated in North America, and the overall war ends. And as a result, Britain assumes nearly all of France's New World colonies. Uh, so mostly up here. Uh, but a good chunk of all of that. Now, just before the end of the war, France cleverly signed a deal with Spain that pretty much gave Spain control of the Mississippi River and Florida. And then a the negotiation said, oh, no, we don't own that part anymore. So Britain mainly got what we know as Canada. But Britain is now much larger and the only now real power in North America. Now, when the war ends in 1763, uh, Britain properly won. Things are great. The colonists are happy. They made a lot of money selling to the British Army during the war. The economy was booming. Everything was great. And in fact, in 1753, the colonists had never been so British. They were proud to be members of the British Empire and were fully aware of the important role that they played. But within two years of the end of this war, all of that would begin to change. New conflicts arose, and for the first time, um, left Americans trying to actually find their proper place within this British world. Now, when the Seven Years' War ended, Britain had a lot of problems on its hands. Primarily, what to do with all of this land. And now, Britain's first post-war prime minister, a man named George Grenville, he decided that the best thing to do for now was to station 10,000 soldiers throughout this new territory just to secure it and then come up with a long-term solution. But this would cost money, which Britain didn't have because it had just spent millions of pounds fighting the French. So to make all this work, Grenville arrived at a plan. Britain would not pay for these soldiers. The Americans would. After all, they're protecting the colonies. 
So in 1764, Parliament passed a tax on North American colonies in order to pay for these soldiers. It's called the Sugar Tax. Or the Sugar Act. Uh, this act was not anything new. It actually modified an existing tax, something called the Molasses, Molasses, Molasses Act. Uh, which basically made British molasses cheaper than French to incentivize Americans buying British molasses. The Sugar Act amended that act and actually made it even cheaper to buy British molasses to try and create more trade. To you know, if you create the more people buying it, it'll pay off. You can pay for the soldiers. And the whole point of the Sugar Act was to raise revenue. And that would be done either through people purchasing French molasses at a higher cost. French molasses was higher quality, um, or buying more of the cheaper British molasses. Either way, Parliament was going to make money. But the colonists were outraged by this. And the primary reason, they couldn't afford it. Uh, Americans had made a lot of money as a result of the French Indian War. After the war, that wartime economy dropped, and the American colonies were in the midst of one of the worst recessions they had ever experienced. People couldn't even afford to buy cheap British molasses, let alone expensive British molasses. And since they could not pay, they did it, which was problematic, because the whole point was to raise money. So since the colonists didn't pay, no revenue was raised, this problem still existed. So the American colonists were basically boycotting sugar and molasses, because they couldn't afford it. Um, which negated the very purpose of the Sugar Act. Now, that doesn't mean they were without sugar. It just means they weren't buying it through the proper ways. In fact, the Sugar Act saw a rise of an age-old American practice, smuggling. <laughs> Port cities, particularly, especially quiet ones, not far, you know, a couple miles up off of a bay, perhaps, became centers of smuggling. Molasses from the French, uh, Dutch sugar, would be quietly snuck in Ask the customs officials. So they weren't willing to pay for expensive French sugar or have to buy more British sugar. But they were willing to buy smuggled sugar, which was still cheaper. So as a result of the Sugar Act, American merchants began to buy most of their sugar from smugglers. So it didn't really work at all, no matter where you looked. Now, the Sugar Act basically showed two different things. Firstly, it showed Parliament that it was especially dependent on the colonies economically. Because if the, economies, or if the colonies aren't playing their part, Parliament's losing out. It needs that income. Mm -hmm. Secondly, it also showed how independent the American colonies actually were. Parliament said, do this. The colonies said, no. And that was it. Parliament couldn't say, no, you're going to do this. Mm -hmm. they, because if the Americans decided not to do it, it didn't happen. It's the reverse of voluntary cooperation. Um, voluntary uncooperation. Right? <laughs> if the colonists didn't voluntarily do it on their own, it wouldn't happen. So they didn't want to pay for the Sugar Act. They just went around the Sugar Act. They still got what they needed. So the Sugar Act basically, well, it fits. There was no increase in tax revenue, and Britain's war debt remained, which was a problem. So, when Grenville introduced the Sugar Act, he already probably he knew it would probably fail. So he had a plan B. And when the act did fail, he launched plan B. Spring of six, uh, 1765, Grenville was calling for the implementation of stamp duties on the colonies. A stamp duty scheme is basically a fee that is paid for a stamp that is affixed uh, to paper products, uh, things like um, paper. Uh, playing cards, anything printed. Um, think of it almost like a sales tax, uh, but it only applied to certain goods, paper products. Now, stamp duties were nothing new in Britain. In fact, the British in Britain paid far more taxes than the British in America ever would. Um, so the British in America thought they had it rough. The British in Britain were paying an incredible amount of taxes. And Grenville thought it was time for the Americans to start carrying their weight. So the Stamp Act put a tax on essentially all paper goods, especially legal documents. But after the Sugar Act, some Americans had arrived at the conclusion 
the Parliament had no actual authority to even tax the colonies. Because if you think of the idea of life, liberty, and property, um, property and liberty go hand in hand in forms of taxes. Who's trying to collect taxes? Parliament. What is Parliament? It's an elective body. Well, who's voting for Parliament? Not the colonists. So therefore, Parliament can't tax them. But Parliament disagreed. They actually had an answer to this. We were represented virtually. You sitting in New Jersey, uh, though you can't vote, somebody like you is voting in Britain, which means their rights and or their concerns and your concerns are basically the same thing. Therefore, you are virtually representat uh, representative. Represented. That's a very simple argument, an argument the colonists didn't necessarily like, but an argument that also kind of made sense, given the role of the colonies within the empire. The purpose of the colonies was to provide goods, not to vote. So following that argument, Parliament claimed it had the right to tax the colonies. And with that, they justified the stamp act. But there was a catch. The Stamp Act required American distribution and administration. So try as they may, it ultimately was up to the Americans to enforce the Stamp Act. Again, voluntary cooperation, which nobody actually cooperated with. So the Stamp Act failed because people just didn't do it. There was nothing Parliament could do to get them to. So Parliament still struck with, stuck with his debt. Had to come up with another way to pay it. So in 1766, a junior prime minister, uh, because William Pitt was made prime minister again, but he was really old and sick, so he had kind of had a vice prime minister take over, a man named Charles Townsend. And Townsend came up with a new plan to pay off the debt and make the Americans play their part within the empire. So it's like a two-pronged attack. They pay off the debt and show America that they're a place within the empire. And he actually enacted a series of acts called the Townsend Acts. It was very simple, the acts. Um, uh, firstly, manufactured goods, those that were imported to America, they all be taxed. And this tax was paid by the wholesale merchants in Britain, not in America. So Americans would have to pay higher prices to offset the taxes the wholesalers were paying, which meant the Americans couldn't go around this tax because this was all that they weren't paying the tax. So Parliament's not even taxing the Americans. They can't even complain about that. And this tax, uh, this tax applied to things like lead, paint, glass, silk, anything manufactured. And because it was external, the tax wasn't happening in the colonies, no one in the colonies could actually complain about it. But when news reached the colonies in 1767 about this, uh, there were no riots. There were no protests. Why? because Parliament was entirely justified in this. It was an external tax. There was nothing the Americans could do. But they still found a way around it. Because at this point, it was the principle. Even though Parliament could do this, Americans weren't going to. Uh, it was the principle. So the colonies decided to unify their opposition. And they agreed to simply not import anything. And then you start to see, finally, in the colonies, Manufacturing, uh, startups making glass, startups making iron. People start spinning their own um, clothing. It's called homespun. It's terribly coarse and uncomfortable, but they wore it anyway in protest. Now, all this was technically illegal, but who was going to stop? The parliament was two thousand miles away. So by stopping or simply by not importing anything, once again, the colonists had found a way to go around the purpose of the tax. And with the exception of Virginia and Maryland, who willingly paid the higher prices because they wanted things, uh, the colonies imported an all-time low from Britain. The economy was actually getting worse, not better, as the act intended. And that is an exclamation point on American protests in 1767. Townsend dies. So if it, it was like if it couldn't get worse for Parliament, the guy running the show died. And between then and 1770, things calmed down, um, with a few exceptions. Um, but by 1773, Parliament was not only still faced with his debt, it had another problem. 
a problem that was actually much more serious. Uh, the centerpiece of the British economy, uh, the British East India Company, was going bankrupt. And if the East India Company failed, the entire British economy would come tumbling down. This was far more urgent than paying off the war debt. Now, the bulk of the trade controlled by the East India Company was tea. Tea purchased from China. So this problem was a serious problem. But there was a potential solution. Uh, because in Parliament, particularly among the more conservative members of Parliament, the Tories, uh, who were very frustrated that America wouldn't play along, they came up with a way to not only save the East India Company, but again, show the Americans their proper role within the empire. So those two things converged in form of the Tea Act in 1773. Now the Tea Act replaced a previous tax on tea with a new one, which was actually cheaper. Uh, and the sole purpose was to save the East Indian Company, while at the same time getting the Americans to actually play their role. And again, the act was incredibly simple. Uh, the only tea people could buy was from the East Indian Company. They were the only people allowed to sell tea in America. <coughs> and if the Americans bought tea from them, the East Indian Company would have enough revenue that it wouldn't go bankrupt. But the Prime Minister, who I think I have a picture of, yes, Lord North, he recognized that this was problematic. Americans don't like to pay taxes. Mm. So he organized the act so that the tax paid by the Americans would be offset by a tax paid by the East India Company. And the two taxes wouldn't, uh, would cancel out, essentially, which actually meant tea would be cheaper than it ever had been before. Hmm. They weren't paying a tax. It was a tax cut. Take that, America. It's basically what he's saying. But things were different now in the colonies. It wasn't as focused on the economy as it once had been. By this point, most people deeply distrusted Parliament. So even when Parliament passed an act to make tea cheaper, Colonists were looking around thinking, well, what are they really up to? What are they really trying to get? This was just a front for future acts of tyranny. Now, the news of the Tea Act in the colonies was accompanied by a uh, widespread um, denouncement. Uh, the Americans already had a way to deal with this as well. They simply didn't buy tea. They were protesting it by non-importation, non-consumption. Again, they turned to smuggle tea, tea from the Dutch East India Company. Um, tea, which again was brought through small little ports and then disseminated throughout the colonies. And in fact, the Tea Act is the one tax that was most susceptible to non-importation, non-consumption, because the whole point of it is to get people to consume it. So the colonies once again united together and agreed not to consume any British tea. And in fact, they went one step further, and they said any tea that is found will be dealt with by local authorities. Now, this was a first. Local people are now getting to play a role in their local governments. This was like the height of Britishness. Liberty. This is what they were doing. So, for example, in December 1774, when some tea is found in Greenwich, the call goes out. We're forming a committee to decide what to do about it. And they're really excited. And then the tea's burned. And some people are kind of bummed that they didn't get to have their committee. They were excited to play this role, this new role, to express this liberty. And they didn't get that chance because the tea was destroyed before they could decide to, they would probably destroy the tea anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, Phil Pickers' 50th Journal mentions everyone's glad the tea is gone, but they're not too happy with how it was disposed of. They wanted to play their part, but instead they just burned it up. <clears throat> now, by 1775, the American colonies had decided they had to do something to try and stop Parliament. So they band together and they form a Continental Congress. The sole purpose was to negotiate with Cong uh, Parliament. But with Parliament seeming dead set on destroying the rights, the British rights of the colonists, Congress began to look for potential other alternatives. And in the spring of 1776, a formal movement of independence developed within the Continental Congress. The committee was a form led by Benjamin Franklin of Pennsylvania, John Adams of um, Massachusetts, uh, assigned with 
writing a document announcing to Parliament the independence of America should the Congress decide to become independent. And they signed the task of writing that document to a young Virginia planner named Thomas Jefferson. And the Declaration of Independence, which is what he wrote, basically establishes that these rights are things that, that the enumerated rights, are things that Parliament had interfered with. And every single one of those rights were seen as British rights. Parliament had become so corrupt that it couldn't even recognize the sovereignty and sacredness of those British rights. So on, uh, in July 1776, when the Continental Congress de declared independence, it did so not to abandon their Britishness, but to preserve their Britishness, to preserve those British rights of life, liberty, and property, or life, liberty, and happiness, as Jefferson wrote. So the revolution resulted in this long run-up, the formation of the uh, colonial role of uh, the role of the colonies within the economy, the foundation of British rights, the British identity. All of that leads directly to the revolution. So the Americans weren't really being American; they were actually trying to be British to maintain those rights. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> gold was excellent because its value was very concrete. But it wasn't mined out outwardly, was it? Uh, not in North America. Uh, gold, uh, those, well, China had most of the world's gold at this point. Uh, silver was also a big player in the colonial economy, thanks to Spanish colonies in South America. But silver wasn't worth all that much because Spain actually harvested, mined so much silver that they almost made it worthless. Uh, Europe actually went into a deep economic depression because of the amount of silver brought back from America. Uh, but by the 1770s, gold was good because gold was always valuable. So would you say that some of the later periods where um, Americans tried to imitate the British or maintain British customs, name buildings in New York City after British buildings, is that a sort of later chapter of what you would call? Yes. In fact, that kind of stems out of something that ordinarily, should you take my class, I would spend all about, you know, talking a lot about, but what what comes after this is this fight between you know uh, you have like Alexander Hamilton and the Federalists versus Jefferson. That mirrors a fight that occurred in Britain and in the, in the buildup of all of this between the court party and the country party. The country party would be Jefferson. The court party would be Hamilton. Um, the court party in New York that was where they were. Hamilton was dominant in New York, so they tried to replicate all of those British things. Um, Jefferson. And the country party was more popular in the countryside, um, which was what the country party, it's, it's called the country party. Um, but the, it does continue, this kind of conflict over do we, what is American, what is British. Um, but it's all about rights, because these were British rights. Only the British knew that these were rights that were natural. And by the 1770s, it seemed as if the British had forgotten that. So in order to preserve the, those British rights, America's cut off the, you know, the dying part. Yes. Uh, I thought I'd give you some information about the tea burner house. Uh, we got a whole display on it every day. Okay. <laughs> My sister is secretary of the historical society. She knew Mrs. Watson before she passed away. Mrs. Watson owned a lot of land around here and owned the tea burner house. It was in very poor condition. My sister hooked up my niece. They bought it. Uh, her husband completely rebuilt it. It was a piece of junk. I would have burned it down. <laughs> he worked on it for probably three or four years by himself, plus some other help. And uh, they restored it. And it's out on T. Burner Road and about two miles from here. Mm -hmm. And apparently that's where farmers, merchants, 
different people of the territory, I guess dressed up as Indians, went down on the ship and got to sea. Right, that's the that house true? where Philip Vickers Fithian lived. Pardon? That's the house where Philip Vickers Fithian lived, who was one of the supposed tear burners. Okay. Um, but who they actually were, uh, we'll probably never know. Well, the actual it had to be local people. Well, I doubt people from Virginia would be coming in. I never heard say about local people. Right, right exactly. Right. Who exactly? Ten mile radius or whatever. Know. And uh, they own it today. Oh my goodness. Jim. Yeah. In right. what later became the state of Maine, uh, when they marked the Kings uh, Pond. The local people would go and cut them down. And it caused quite a... Right. Quite a thing. What was happening in New Hampshire was happening in Maine, too. Yeah. But that was part of Massachusetts. Yep. They didn't have that in Maine. Well, no. In fact, Massachusetts, during this, because, you know, we're in New Jersey. We don't care about Massachusetts. <laughs> Massachusetts was not... Um, uh, England always hated Massachusetts. In fact, at one point, they take away Massachusetts' charter as a punishment. And they basically say, you're not even allowed to run your government. And they created the Dominion of New England, which actually included New Jersey briefly. It was pretty much the entire Northeast, ruled by the Duke of York. Uh, and then later, it was broken back up. Um, but a lot of it had to do with Massachusetts was not willing to play a part in the economy. Plus, they didn't really have a lot much to offer. Yes? This is more of a question. Yeah. You hear so much about the locals uh, when I declare their independence, but there was quite a few that really were pro-British. Why would that be? What was their mindset? Were they afraid to start a new government, or were they afraid of retaliation from the British? Or? Well, um, it really depended. Um, a lot of people, it really depended on what time of the war it was, depending on where you were. Um, early on, 1774, 1775, no one south of New England wanted to fight the British. That was ridiculous. Why would you do that? Um, by 1776, people didn't necessarily want to fight the British, but they recognized that something had to change. Uh, now, some loyalists, they basically said, well, this is just a passing, you know, a little passing argument. The, the, the next parliamentary election, all of this will change. And in fact, the next parliamentary election saw the, the, the Whigs come into power, who very quickly ended the American Revolution. Um, and they basically called the war off um, because they recognized it wasn't in the best interest of England to keep fighting. Uh, that you might as well let them be independent and then set up a trade relationship which mirrored that original colonial agreement, which is exactly what happened more or less. So, so they viewed them as like rebels then? Uh... Well, in fact, uh, Parliament was kind of um, sidestepped by the King. Parliament was trying to deal with this, and the King announced in August 1776, um, um, or uh, 1775, that the colonies were in an open state of rebellion. And that shocks the Americans, because they were like, we're just trying to figure out how we fit in this. And if the King considers us rebels, that's, major, that's a major step. So then they began to think, well, maybe we should just cut off that. Because obviously, they don't see that what we're doing is trying to preserve our rights not just causing problems. It's all about the rights. Uh, at the same time, you had a lot of people who wanted to remain lo loyalists because they thought, you know, well, there's no way America could win. Or we're trying to be neutral, like many of the Quakers. Right. And saying that, that this should just be a nonviolent resolution of the conflict. Right, exactly. And that's the thing. It was just, this was like a temporary situation. Um, it wouldn't, nothing would have come of it, you know, give a change of administration and Parliament might realize it's a mistake. Which, again, kind of happened, but not really. Happened in <laughs> Yeah, well, in fact, the British learn a lot in terms of commonwealths. And when later Canada is made a commonwealth, uh, that's basically what the United States wanted to be. The Olive Branch petition sent in June 1775 basically said, let us be independent, but we'll still be part of Britain. Um, but that showed up after the king already declared them in a rebellion and it was never really even read. Really, if, if they had our communication, the revolution never would have happened. Um, because it took um, three months, uh, eight weeks more or less, depending on the time of year, to get to England, and longer to get back. So news took about six, seven months total to do the round trip. And a lot can happen in, in over half a year. Hmm. Yes? Oh, thank you.
you so much for that great informative speech. Um,